when you're ready. Yes, sir. We are ready to begin the meeting. All right. Good morning. I'd like to uh, call to order the September 28th special meeting of the Public Planning Committee. And Teresa, are we in compliance with FOIA? Yes, sir, we are. Thank you. And would you call the roll, please? Certainly. Ms. Becker? Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Mr. Stanford? Here. Mr. Ames? Here. And Teresa, uh, we have two sets of minutes. Uh, and if there is no objection, is there a, mo a motion to approve both? So moved. Is there a second? Thank second. you, there's a second, Ms. Becker. Would you call the roll, Teresa? Yes, sir. Ms. Becker? Yes. Mr. Brown? Approve. Mr. Stanford? Yes. Mr. Ames? Yes, appreciate that. Approved uh, unanimously. Uh, do we have uh, any public comments today, Teresa? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, public comments concerning agenda items were to be submitted electronically via the open town hall portal. The portal closed at 430 yesterday and there were no comments of record. In addition to submitting comments on the portal, citizens were provided the opportunity to call into the meeting to comment. However, we do not have any citizens signed up to speak during today's meeting. All right, thank you very much. The purpose of today's meeting is to receive a staff update and presentation on the current status of the short-term rental ordinance. Terry Lewis, is, are you prepared to make a presentation? Yes, I am. Please go ahead, thank you. Hi. Good morning, I'm Terry Lewis, Deputy Community Development Director, and we're here today, like Councilman Ames said, to talk about short-term rentals which has been identified as a priority for the town. Before I get started, Mark just asked me to share his apologies for not being part of this meeting. He was planning to attend when it was last week, but he was already committed to speaking at the realtors meeting when this was rescheduled um, to today. So we last met about this issue in June, and at that point, staff presented the results of our research related to short-term rental ordinances in over 20 communities. And we discussed commonalities between those codes. The committee shared that they had concerns related to the impact of short-term rentals on neighborhoods, and in particular, concerns related to noise, safety, parking, trash, and then the lack of a contact person when there are problems. Committee members also identified that occupancy, occupancy should be limited, there should be yearly inspections, and the definition of a short-term rental should be very clear. In terms of numbers, we have a little over 33,000 residential units on the island, and of those, approximately 9,500 have potentially been identified as short-term rentals. So it's clear that we do need to make some changes to address short-term rentals on our island. Now with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our consultants, White and, White and Smith LLC. We've contracted with them to draft a legal and effective short-term rental ordinance. And as you'll see from their presentation, they have extensive experience in this, uh, this area, and we're really looking forward to working with them on this project. And now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tyson Smith, who's the principal in charge for this project. Okay, thank you, Terry. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with morning. you this morning. Good morning. As Terry said, my name is Tyson Smith. I'm a co-owner of White and Smith Planning and Law Group. We're a national planning firm. We just happen to be up here in Charleston. so. We're nearby. Um, we, we handle code projects for cities and counties around the country on all manner of land use issues, um, but have had um, the opportunity to uh, attack the short term rental problem as this uh, developed over the last 20 years or so, including some work we did over at Kiwa Island in the, about 20 years ago, as a matter of fact, right when that, that issue was taken on for the first time. Um, so we'll go over some um, thoughts we have on this issue with you this morning. Um, Kelly Cousineau with our firm here is going to jump in. She's the project manager for us on this project. We also have Sean Scoopmeyer with us from our firm as well. Sean is in Greenville and Kelly's in uh, Owenda. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly and um, see you in a second. Thanks, Tyson. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Go I on. am going to pull up a PowerPoint here. Bear with me one second. All right. Well, as Tyson said, my name is Kelly Cousineau. I'm a planner with White and Smith Planning and Law Group. I'm excited to be with you this morning to introduce you to our team and to start a conversation about a short-term rental ordinance. Um, Tyson introduced um, Sean and I, um, but we are also, our work is also supported by um, partner Mark White and uh, planner Reese Wilson. Um, our team has quite a bit of experience um, with short-term rentals going back um, to the mid-90s with Tyson's experience as a city planner in Key West, Florida. Um, we've had quite a bit of experience over the last five or so years with the, um, the rise of the sharing economy and online platforms that really facilitate um, home sharing and short-term rentals. Um, and Tyson and I are going to give you a little bit more detail about a few of these, um, a few of these projects later on in the presentation. In terms of our scope of work for this project, um, we are tasked with developing um, a, an appropriate and effective short-term rental ordinance that's unique to Hilton Head Island. Um, we're just getting underway with the project. Um, this workshop with you all this morning is one of the first steps. We are also in the process of scheduling focus group sessions with um, different community groups to make sure that we get um, a really good holistic understanding of the opportunities and challenges associated with short-term rentals in Hilton Head Island. Um, once we put pen to paper, the first thing we'll do is put together a an outline of a proposed approach to regulating short-term rentals. Um, and we will um, share that with staff and with this committee to get your feedback before we move forward with um, actually drafting the ordinance itself. Um, we do anticipate that there will be several iterations of the ordinance, um, starting with one for planning and legal staff review, um, then followed by uh, drafts for review by the LMO committee, the planning commission, as well as this committee. Um, and then finally, uh, two readings by town council. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it back to Tyson for a few minutes. Tyson, this is David Ames. Will both of these presentations be available to go onto the town web website after this meeting? And this is all the same presentation. We just thought it would be easier to switch back and forth a bit. So is everybody seeing the Why Act PowerPoint yes. slide? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a, st a good starting point, I think, for almost any project we have. Um, but I want to speak, of course, specifically to the short-term rental issue. Um, the approach we have learned, sometimes painfully to take with all of our projects, is that we don't really have a dog in the fight except to do good work and to lead our clients through a process that leads to a good decision for that client. And that's certainly true of short-term rentals. Um, we don't have a dog in the fight one way or the other. We do think it's important. Um, to find that balance, though, there's going to be an interest, I think, in the community that there be some opportunity to to use their homes and their um, their buildings as short term rentals. There's also going to be a, a very strong interest in the community, of course, of addressing the quality quality of life impacts that can be implicated with that. I live in downtown Charleston, um, and I have a rental unit that's eligible for this particular use, um, so that gives me some perspective as well. So. One of the big things then is we start off deciding why should we even do anything is to clarify the rules. We'll, we're gonna talk about four or five projects today or different jurisdictions today that'll give you a sense of what that means, but, large, but, but also importantly, um, the drawback of not having a set of clear rules. It's bad for the people who have short-term rentals, it's bad for the community, and it's bad for the people who rent them. Um, 
that leads immediately to the next point, and that is consistent enforcement. Um, you'll see that the communities I think that are successful, um, they have this. Everybody knows the rules and they know how to enforce them. They also know when there's nothing to enforce because they know the rules. Um, that, that again leads to the next bullet, the importance of certainty and predictability for those who are operating short-term rentals and those who um, are in the neighborhoods um, that have them operating in them. You know, I, I said in, in 2002, I was with a prior firm at that point. <clears throat> We came down and helped um, the town council of Kiowa to, to sort through this issue. And this was even before Airbnb and that sort of thing. Um, and as Kelly said, I had experienced it as a city planner in Key West uh, a few years before that. Um, that obviously has become more popular. Um, I suspect that it's here to stay. And for that reason, I think it's important, as Terry pointed out, that the town of Hilton Head Island have its own approach to how it wants to handle it. You're going to see examples all over the board of what different communities have done. And that's because each community has a different set of problems and a different set of challenges. It has a different style, has a different tolerance for noise and for activity, and it has a different tolerance and expectation when it comes to regulation. So the key will be to have a tailored program for Hilton Head Island that will be durable. And that is one you can just tweak as needed, but we won't have to change a lot once it's put in place. And that gets importantly to the process that we're gonna lay out for you and hopefully walk you through. There are some simple things, some baseline things like safety and accountability that are important as with all regulation. Um, and we also want to, and along those same lines, want to ensure that short-term rentals that are permitted are compatible with other permitted uses. So again, it's not an either or, it's just that if we're gonna all live here together, operate near one of each other, near one another, um, that we have compatibility between single family living, for example, and a single family home is being used for a week by a vacationer. Um, there are a lot of approaches. I want to give you an overview of those that we've used, those that we have seen, those that you'll find there throughout South Carolina. Um, and then we'll talk about, as I said, four or five specific jurisdictions that have used a number of these things. But I wanted to make sure they're all in front of you. I know you've gone over this a few months ago, but just so we're all on the same page. Some some local governments simply clarify terms and um, that have gone unclarified um, or have been, there's been debate about what their meaning is. These could include the ones I've listed here, bed and breakfast, interval occupancy, hotels, dwelling unit, what, what's the definition of a family, how many occupants can be in the home versus the short-term rental, that sort of thing. What we mean by residential purpose, that's a term that you use in your um, in the LMO now that's not defined. So it's important that we know what those things mean. It's important that income reporting occur and that taxes be paid. That's been a requirement that's been protected now and codified by the South Carolina legislature. And that's very common along most of the jurisdictions, certainly along the coast is that accommodation taxes have to be paid and business taxes um, and licenses have to be in place. And I think that's locked in now in Hilton Head Island too, as of about right now. Do we look at the duration of a stay of a short-term rental or the number of short-term rental um, terms that can occur in a year or in a month. Occupancy limitations, how many in each home? Kewa Island has that, others have that. There has to be a contact as, as y'all have talked about already, someone to file a complaint with and also to get a response from in a quick, in a quick manner. What are the impacts that are trying to be mitigated? Um, housing stock and cost, that was the big one when I worked in the city of Key West because it was a uh, we found that our affordable housing stock or our work, workforce housing stock was being impacted. It impacts the hotel and accommodation industry, obviously. And I suspect some of the community in Hilton Head Island will, will contribute to this discussion along those lines. Neighborhoods, of course, tenant safety comes up. And Charleston and some other ones have good examples of making sure that fire, fire inspections and other safety protocols are followed. The tools we see used typically, of course, are zoning districts and overlays. We've got some examples for you this morning, like Kiowa that fits its short-term rental approach right into its existing, um, largely right into its existing zoning framework. Um, but other communities like Charleston and Charleston County that have actually adopted uh, overlay districts to treat different parts of those jurisdictions differently when it comes to short-term rentals. Um, Density of short-term rentals by zoning or plan district. This is um, something that Mount Pleasant has done and that Kiwa Island has done as well. We'll touch on that momentarily. 
Does the unit that's being used for short-term rentals have to be um, occupy an owner? Does the owner have to be present? Do they just have to be available? Um, this goes, of course, to complaints and responsiveness to complaints. Um, do they have, or can they be manager owned or manager managed, manager managed rather? And if that's the case, what protections can we put into place again to make sure that complaints are responded to quickly? Um, is there a limit on the number of bedrooms that can be in a short-term rental or a unit that's used for short-term rental? And then there's sort of these behavioral issues that we think about noise, parking, condition of the property. So I'm sure these have come up in your discussions. So I'd like now to talk about Kiwa Island and our experience there. If there are no questions, uh, Terry or David, should I just continue? Yeah, well, are there any questions at this time from the committee? I do have, okay. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Ms. Becker. Oh no, I was just answering that at this time. <laughs> Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, Alex or Glenn? Yes, I have one. Uh, could you give us a little bit of your uh, professional background and expertise in this area? I, I see that you've done it before, but mm -hmm. I'm curious, are you uh, planners? Are you architects? Are you lawyers? What? Uh, good question. We are planners and attorneys. Um, I am a South Carolina attorney. Uh, Mark White, my partner, is an attorney as well. And Sean Scootmeyer, who's with us this morning is also an attorney and Sean's in Greenville. He's also a South Carolina attorney. I'm also a Florida attorney. So our capacity with you officially in this case is as planners, we have a planning contract with you, but our legal background allows us to of course, converse with town council as needed. Um, that's SEL as needed on legal issues. Um, one of the projects that was on our earlier slide with Kelly, in fact, we, so we will we'll be thinking about these legal issues as we draft as planners. Um, and one of the projects that, that Kelly mentioned earlier in Brevard County, Florida, was entirely a legal um, evaluation of a short-term rental issue. Thank you. I think that answers my question. Okay, very good. Um, Tyson, uh, you're going through a very good presentation with us. Is this basically the same presentation you would use with focus groups? We can, certainly. I, I think I'd appreciate your feedback. I think it probably is a good way to get everybody on the same page. Is that well, your let's, thought? Let's, let's talk about it at the conclusion of the uh, presentation. Okay. Go ahead. Very good. Okay. So as I said, um, in 2002, I was with a firm out of Kansas City at the time. Kiwa Island hired us um, to come down and, and start addressing this issue. Um, we spent a good deal of time working with the town council um, to sort through what it exactly it was that they wanted to address and how they wanted to address it. So these are literally some screenshots from some slides we used back then. Um, so the first thing we were looking at is use restrictions and zoning techniques. You can see the, their major residential zoning categories there. And we just went through this process with them of, of identifying what it was that was important. We looked at you know, procedures for approvals, you know, as this should be approved by staff, what should be approved by staff, what should be bumped up to the planning commission or the town council. And then of course the land use impacts. And this is, there's a longer list than this. I just have this example here, but where are these impacts important? You know, what's important R1 might not be as important R3. There's gonna be a little bit more active and people have those expectations. The other thing I'd point out about Kiowa that I think is a great analogy for you all is that there's so many well, you've got Kiwa Island behind the gate, and you've got Kiwa Island in front of the gate, of course. And that's not exactly, right, that's not like Hilton Head, but you do have a lot of communities in Hilton Head that are behind a gate. Um, so I think that dynamic will probably come to play with other, you know, I'm going to assume homeowners associations and restrictive covenants and private covenants and that sort of thing. So that was the, the process we went through with them back then. Now, what was really adopted at that time, I should say, was fairly minor. Um, the issue was very hot at the time, but at the end of the day, there were just some of those behavioral issues, I think, that they took on when we completed our work with them. We took on nonconforming uses issues, um, worked very closely with their attorney at the time on those issues. Um, so, but at the end of the day, I think they wanted to take a lighter touch. Now, what they have today is, is quite different. Um, it has evolved. Um, to be more dynamic, more expansive, I think. Um, some of the basics, you have to have a business license. Operating requirements apply. Um, interestingly, Kiowa has 
caps on short-term rentals in R1 and some of the R2 uh, districts. Um, those caps are based on the number of licenses per developable lot, because of course, he was still developing or still building out. Um, that we can get more into that, but that basically is an annual um, renewal uh, process. Um, I like this idea. It's handled differently in different places, but it gives, in my view, it's a tool for allowing people the opportunity of homeowners, the opportunity to, to make that income that's available to them, but at the same time, address the intensity of that use. So there are different ways to do that. But anyway, they have that at Kiowa. Uh, um, Tyson, if yes, I sir. might interrupt. Cool. Um, so if, if a, a district has 500 units uh, of regular, or 500 total units, are you saying that a cap on short-term rentals might be 100 of those 500? Is that correct? OK, got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Q also has notice of rules um, that are required, have to have a local contact required. That's local contact, not like my contract. <coughs> there, are, there, are, there are actually occupancy limits in Kiowa. Um, I think it's two people per legal bedroom plus two people, um, but that's just one example. Um, parking and outdoor lighting standards. Um, basically, the outdoor lighting standards apply uh, island wide, but the parking standards make sure that people are in parking or in driveways. They're not in yards or on the street. Trash collection requirements are there. Um, and then very, very clear enforcement procedures. Now, if you go onto the website for Kiowa Island and Charleston, city of Charleston is this way too. And, and in my view, this is sort of a successful program, I think. Um, you know, you're gonna, it's gonna be very easy to see what the story is in Kiowa Island when it comes to short-term rentals, whether you're a renter um, whether you're a homeowner um, or whether you want to report a problem. Now, if you click on, and I don't have it active here, but if you clicked on that I am a renter button, um, it's a very welcoming um, uh, page that says, we look forward to you visiting Kiowa. It's not an off-putting message by any means. Um, and then, you know, if you go through the next slides and we'll show one here, the next um, um, the <coughs> next section, sections there, again, it's going to keep you very focused and make it very easy. So in, in my view, this is helpful for a number of reasons. One, we talked about clarifying the rules. Um, this has nothing to do with whether they're very strict or very lenient or in the between, it's just very clear what they are. So if I'm a homeowner in Charleston, it's kind of confusing just by reading the text of whether I can rent my home. And if I can, what applies, it's, this makes it easy. And the city of Charleston makes it easy. It also makes it easy for me if my neighbors have short-term renters and they're being too loud on a Tuesday night. I know how to report that. Now that's important also if I'm a short-term renter, excuse me, if I'm a homeowner doing short-term rentals because I know that my neighbor can easily report me. <laughs> so I have an added incentive to make sure that my renters behave, you know, or they can contact me if there's a problem. Now, if you're the operator of a short-term rental in Kiwa Island, there's a whole separate webpage um, on the website that leads you through how to apply for a permit, what the current ordinance is. It was just recently amended about a year ago. Um, location map, zoning designations by street. In other words, it's just very easy to use. And I think that's one of the strong points for Kiowa. Um, I move on to Charleston. And then at that point, I'll turn it over to Kelly to go over some jurisdictions. And that might be another good spot for some questions if you have. Okay, city of Charleston, same thing. Um, very good website. It's, um, it's user friendly. Um, you see there, is my property eligible? If you click on that box there in the upper right hand corner of that left hand screenshot up here, you go to this website here and it just clicks through. And you uh, hopefully at, land at the answer of whether or not you can um, use your home as a short term for short term rental purposes. I, I've heard a presentation from the city of Charleston staff about, about two years ago now, it's before COVID. Um, at a planning conference and they they did an excellent job the the, the 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 level of resources that they put into their development of this program and then to maintain it is very high um it was as you can imagine just very very important to a city like this one for affordable housing issues and for quality of life issues um they had a great process i think and they've landed on a quite sophisticated program and and, and it's pretty sophisticated in the way they lay it out on the website 
Um, the basics are, of course, the business licenses and taxes. Um, here, um, the short-term rental property has to be owner-occupied by permanent residents. You have to be a 4% um, homestead um, uh, um, resident, um, and you have to be owner-occupied. Um, it can't be manager-managed. Um, we will get to, inevitably, the question of what happens to current short-term rentals as we start talking about potential new rules. So the question will come up. Um, in city of Charleston, if your short-term rental was occurring prior to the adoption of the new ordinance, um, it was not allowed to continue unless it could comply with the new ordinance. Um, that's just one of several options along a spectrum of options when it comes to non-compliant use, non-conforming uses. Um, there's strict parking requirements. Um, there are cap, a cap on occupants. Um, for regardless of relationship. So I thought it was interesting they thought of that. So nobody's out there having to ask somebody if they're related to one another. Um, hosts must be generally available. So you have to be, you have your, your unit has to be um, owner occupied, but you don't have to be there all the time. So long as you are generally available. Um, fire, and inspection, fire inspections and life safety um, apply. And then there's enforceability um, and the livability of court, which again is a pretty, um, uh, evolved way of handling quality of life issues that places like Charleston tend to tend to rely on heavily, but enforcement is big time here. And I I, I don't want to quote exactly, but I think there are at least two code enforcement officers in the city that are dedicated just to this purpose. So that gives you a sense of of the seriousness with which they take it. Um, a couple of years ago, I was looking back through my notes when they gave this presentation. Uh, when staff gave this presentation, there were about 45 cases, as I recall, pending before the livability court related to short-term rentals. So it's something like many things down here they've taken quite seriously. They have a tiered approach to how they um, enforce their, their rules and how they develop their program. The short-term rental overlay here is um, in this blue area. This actually is very near where I live. Um, it's the heart of the city that was very commercial and had the most of these uses already, I think, when they came into, uh, when they started to address the issue. Um, then category one is the purple area here. That's um, the historic district that many of you, are, many of us are familiar with. Um, the only houses that can be used in that district for short-term rentals are those listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So the idea there, that might seem counterintuitive to some people, but I think the idea there is that's that's the hospitality industry that downtown Charleston present, pre presents. So if you're here as a visitor in a short-term rental, just like at a hotel, we anticipate that being associated with historic properties. Um, similarly, the rest of the peninsula can have short-term rentals, this peach area here, um, but the building has to be at least 50 years old. Um, I wasn't privy to all the conversations that led to that, of course, but um, that's what applies there. And then the rest of the city in the green, as you get off the peninsula, um, short-term, rentals were not allowed due to the definitions of single family home prior to adopting the tiered approach in the short-term rental ordinance a few years ago, but now they are. So that was sort of a going in both directions um, type of thing that happened. Well, let me stop there. And um, Kelly will talk about York County and Charleston County and Mount Pleasant and um, see if there are any questions to this point. Public Planning Committee members, are there any questions? All right, go ahead, Kelly. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, our firm is currently working with York County, South Carolina on a comprehensive update to its zoning and subdivision codes. Um, short-term rentals, we, we've proposed some use regulations for short-term rentals. They um, are not a big issue in York County at this time. Um, I think a lot of the short-term rentals are actually in the incorporated parts of the county, like Rock Hill and Fort Mill, um, and to a lesser extent in the unincorporated areas. But um, the county wants to be proactive um, to get in front of this issue. You know, we, there's, there's always unexpected things that happen that really sort of change the the course of different issues like COVID and, and thing, you know, virtual meetings have gotten big. Um, so they wanna make sure that they are prepared um, if and when short-term rentals do become a, um, 
more desired in York County. Um, they've really taken sort of a, well, I, I should I should mention that this is it's still in draft format hasn't been adopted yet, but what's proposed is a fairly minimal approach. Um, there's an owner registration requirement, there is an annual limit on the number of days per year that you could rent um, short term rental. Um, and then there's a restriction on the number of guests and and based on staff feedback they've actually done sort of a dual um, occupancy limit where only um, up to eight guests can stay overnight, but during the day, you, you can have up to 20 guests at the house. Um, and this does only apply to rentals um, that are less than 30 days. So again, just some very sort of mineral, minimal, straightforward regulations, um, just to be proactive about this issue. Um, okay, so Town of Mount Pleasant. Uh, before I started with White and Smith, I spent about 12 years as a planner for the Town of Mount Pleasant. And when I worked with the town, the code did not specifically address short-term rentals. Um, early on, it wasn't really a big deal. You know, we had a few bed and breakfasts here and there. Um, but as the, the sharing economy really started to take off, um, we have started to see a lot more interest in short-term rentals. And because the code, the zoning code did not specifically address them, it led to the interpretation of existing provisions um, to where owner-occupied short-term rentals were interpreted as bed and breakfast. Um, so if, if, for example, I wanted to rent out just a room in my house or perhaps my accessory dwelling unit in the backyard, that required me to get a special exception approval by the Board of Zoning Appeals, which requires you know, a public meeting and notice and all of that. Whereas um, non-owner occupied short-term rentals, you know, whether the owner lived elsewhere in town or in another city or the house or, or a unit was owned by you know, an investment company, those were just a permitted use and there was no review required. And that, um, what we came to realize was that that was sort of the opposite of what the community wanted to see. You know, there was a lot more support for owner occupied short term rentals because there was, you know, you can kind of keep an eye on your tenants and, and make sure that um, you're, you're minimizing impacts on your neighbors. Um, so the town really saw that need to balance the, the different interests and respond to the community concerns. So in um, 2020, which was after I was, um, had left the town, so we were not involved in the drafting of this, but they did adopt um, some regulations specific to short-term rentals. A lot of it's really focused on um, information, um, notice requirements and safety. There is an annual limit of 400 short-term rental permits that are available in the town. Each requires um, that particular permit, a valid business license, as well as um, liability insurance. The property owner also has to um, sign a form acknowledging that they're aware of you know, all of the regulations that apply to short-term rentals. There's also another um, affidavit of compliance with, um, I think it's like two or three pages of fire safety criteria for tenant safety. Um, there's also requirements, um, as there are in, in most communities, I think, um, that you notify the tenants, you know, put something on, on the fridge or the bulletin board in the unit of the laws that apply um, to the short term rental in terms of noise and trash and litter and that sort of thing. Um, really, the only uh, sort of use regulation specific to short term rentals for that occupancy limit and then the requirement for one additional parking space. And I do believe that the town um, contracts with a, a company, a business that sort of tracks short term rentals um, and ensures that, you know, folks are paying their the required taxes. And finally, um, Charleston County, we, um, our firm was on a team uh, or is on a team that's working to revise Charleston County's um, zoning and land development regulations. And our um, partner, Mark White, was very involved in sort of the, the foundational work that went into preparing the short-term rental ordinance for Charleston County. They, um, ultimately adopted a tiered approach, um, somewhat similar to what the city did, um, but in, in Charleston County, uh, the tiers are based on the number of rental days per year. 
So the, the limited home rental is available in the, the most number of zoning districts, you know, a lot of their residential districts. It does require owner occupancy, and there's a limit of 72 days um, in a calendar year where you can rent um, your, your unit. Then there's extended home rentals, which gives you a little bit longer, you know, up to not quite six months or so, uh, I guess five months. Um, that is allowed in residential districts as well, fewer districts than the limited home rental, and it does require approval um, by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And then um, they also have commercial guest houses, which are um, allowed in commercial districts. So they're really more, um, more like a hotel and, and, more, and, and treated more that way. Um, like the other jurisdictions we've talked about, there is an annual permit and a valid business license required, a variety of tenant notices um, regarding the safety and other laws. Um, the county does require one parking space per bedroom. And then interestingly, they um, have a five-year amortization program for non-conforming short-term rentals. So they're taking you know, folks who's, um, who've been operating short-term rentals, have five years to sort of phase out the short-term rental um, or, or come into compliance with the new regulations. And as, as Tyson mentioned earlier, there's really kind of a, a spectrum of, of ways to deal with existing um, short-term rental units. So with that, that brings us to um, some questions for you all. We um, really wanted to get the conversation going and understand um, you know, the, the challenges and opportunities with short-term rentals here. So this is just a, a few questions to kind of get the, the conversation started. We're interested in, in understanding what type of impacts need to be mitigated um, for quality of life purposes. We're also interested in hearing what type of comments do you all hear the most often about short-term rentals? Should there be more, fewer, or the same number of short-term rentals on Hilton Head Island? Do you think demand for these type of, of vacation rentals is likely to remain high? And then finally, what does a durable functioning short-term rental program look like on Hilton Head Island? Um, I'll leave those up for the moment. We, we do have a final slide on next steps, um, but Mr. Ames, if, if the committee is ready to kind of discuss or ask questions, we're happy to, to do that at this point. I'm sure they're chomping at the bit. Um, Ms. Becker, would you like to lead off? Sure, thank you. Um, you, you referred to, through the discussion, a, a reference to owner-occupied rentals. Explain um, how, what you mean exactly by that? Sure, typically that means that the, um, the property owner uses the property as their full-time residence. So this may be somebody who's renting out one or more rooms in their principal dwelling. Um, they might have an accessory dwelling, you know, detached from the house, the garage apartment or something. Um, and some communities do allow short-term rentals to occur um, within an accessory dwelling. Um, I know Mount Pleasant requires, um, for accessory dwellings, they require the owner to live on site, um, either in the accessory dwelling or in, in the main house. Um, so there's that aspect of it. But, but yes, it would typically be that the owner um, makes it their primary residence. And then in South Carolina, that would mean the 4% annual property tax rate. Typically, so in some of the discussions, um, one of the questions that is in the back of my mind is anything that we do with regard to short-term rentals. And maybe this is a bigger conversation, but um, just a quick question: How does, if at all, this impact um, timeshares? That might be a question for Tyson. <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about timeshares. Well, okay. it's to be determined. Um, okay. The, the, the timeshares certainly fall closer along the spectrum, um, closer to hotels, and will likely be treated differently and separately. Um, that gets us back to the definition, you know, question. Okay. I don't think that that's what people mostly have in mind as a short-term rental, but that's a conversation we need to have. 
No, I, I think I tend to agree with you. It's not what most people um, think of either, but I do know that the question has come up and okay. that people have, um, at least on Hilton Head, a um, concern with regard to how timeshares function. So I thought I would ask. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure, David, if you want to jump into these uh, five questions now or yes. just, oh, yes. Okay. I, I think that's they're asking for input, but also opinions that might not relate to these questions. Okay. Well, I don't want to dominate the conversation, so um, I'm happy to briefly go through these and then circle back around to add. Um, but um, on the first one, what impacts need to be mitigated for the quality of life? Um, the impacts to the residential neighborhoods um, have been come overwhelming with uh, many of the issues that you've brought up, parking, noise, size of home, exclusivity of rentals. Um, so in essence, being a commercial enterprise rather than a single family home in, a, in the residential neighborhood zone. Um, the trash um, impacts further down the road with regard to bicycles and um, those sorts of things. What comments do you hear most often about short-term rentals? I think um, often the, the, those two questions are one and the same. People are very concerned in the residential neighborhoods. Um, people who are living here full-time, whether it's exclusively a residential neighborhood or not, um, worried about their quality of life and how it's been changed dramatically um, by the uh, types of things I just mentioned and some of which you addressed in your presentation. Should there be more, whoops, should there be more fewer current numbers of short-term rentals on the island? Um, I think that we have become um, very overwhelmed with the number of short-term rentals. Um, and so that is uh, the best answer I can give for that in, as a short answer. Is demand for short-term rentals likely to remain high on Hilton Head Island? I believe that answer is um, yes. It seems to be a viable commercial enterprise and investment for, for people. Um, I'm not sure, and I'm, that's not correct. I am sure that that's not um, in the best interest of Hilton Head Island residents in our future. Um, and um, what does a durable functioning short-time rental program look like on Hilton Head? It addresses many of the things you talked about, um, parking, um, safety, noise, appropriateness um, of the area. And David, for now, I'm gonna leave it at that. So again, I don't use up all the air in the room. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Tammy. Glenn, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yes, thank you. Um... First of all, let me say that I think we've got the right consultant here. You obviously have great experience in this area and uh, we can learn a lot from what you tell us and from what other communities have done. But I have a threshold question here and that is, is do we have the ability beyond licensing uh, and taxing to further regulate existing uh, short-term rental properties? It's more of a legal question than it is anything else. And mm -hmm. um, you folks don't know, but I'm a recovering lawyer myself. And that's why that kind of issue occurs to me. Yeah, sure. Uh, so would an example of what you're asking be, I've been operating a short-term rental for years now. I didn't have any limitation on occupancies, um, but now you've imposed one that limits my ability to do what I was doing. Yes. Yeah, the authority to do that is is very clear, um, unless it were so onerous to get into a level of you know prohibiting any use of the property. Um, yes, sir. We we can begin to regulate them. Correct. Okay, that's good. Has that been tested in the courts? The the concept is thoroughly tested. Um, whether it's related to short term rentals, I don't recall. Okay. You know, there'll, there'll um, be there'll be sort of fairness questions, political questions, and legal questions, and I would say that one typically falls more into the legislative, you know, policy. Typically, not legal. All right. Um, 
what impacts need to be mitigated for quality of life? Um, you've heard it already, but I'll repeat it. Um, noise, congestion, uh, rowdy behavior, uh, ignoring the rules, um, difficulty of enforcement. I think we have two enforcement officers for all ordinance matters here on Hilton Head Island. Uh, that, does, that does not make any sense to any of us and we need to be prepared to tighten our belts and increase that. Um, but what's happening is the nature of life on Hilton Head Island is changing dramatically from my point of view. Mm -hmm. um, many of the communities that used to be owner occupied, many times second homes have become uh, short-term rentals. Um, and that's because there is a great market for it, which is one of the questions you've got here. I don't see the demand for short-term rental, rentals here going down at all. Um, we've seen it increasing over the years. Uh, we see more and more uh, of the properties being converted. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very concerned about the spread of this island-wide. Um, there are controls on it within the gated communities, um, and, and some of the gated communities regulate it, so others don't. Um, the one I happen to live in has no short-term rentals, um, but others do permit them just because of the nature of that particular community. Um, so <laughs> if there was some way to put a limit or reduce the number of short-term rentals here, that would be very desirable, but I, I have concerns about the enforceability of that. I would think that we need, we would set the limit possibly at the number of units presently. And then if one of those uh, ceases to operate as a short-term rental, the number of available units would decline accordingly. But that's gonna be a very, very tiny, small incremental change in going through that. So. We'll need your input on that. I love the idea of districts where these are permitted. Um, we have talked here a lot about some master planning, uh, something David Ames is an expert about. And uh, so if we can begin to do that, that would be great. At the same time, we've already got short-term rentals scattered around everywhere that is not, not already prohibited. So I do think the demand is going to remain high. Um, a, a durable functioning program. Um, I am a shameless copier, um, as many lawyers are, and uh, I love many of the ideas that I see that have been successful in other communities. So we will look forward to your guidance and moving this forward. Thank you, David. Thank you, Glenn. Alex, you've been quiet. Alex, are you there? Yeah, I've been listening and, and, and learning and trying to gather my, uh, my thoughts and my questions here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity. And I thank uh, Tyson and, and Kelly for the presentation. Um, I've got a few questions before I get to um, their quest of us. Um, I understand the, the, I guess the first slide that, that showed the goals here, develop an ordinance for short-term rentals. I'm just curious to know, does, um, does your scope of work or a contract that you all have with us um, establish a problem statement? It does not. Okay. I would say it, it articulates the topic. Okay. So, so these questions that you have before us are helping to develop that problem statement, I, I would assume. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I, 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 I'll, uh, I'll try my best. Okay. Um, 
when I get to these uh, these these questions of yours, but I think that that's very critical um, as we move forward as to we really understand the problem at hand, okay, um, as you start to come back with recommendations. Okay. Um, you mentioned that there, there, there are going to be meetings with stakeholders. Can you give some examples of who those stakeholders may be? Yes, sir. So here is a list um, that we've we've started uh, making contact with some of these groups, and we do have um, our first focus group session scheduled for this Friday with some of the um, representatives from planned unit developments. Um, this is the list that came to mind for for staff and for us, um, and we are would certainly love your suggestions um, of anybody you know anyone that we're we're missing from that list. Um, we really want to understand you know all all perspectives when it comes to short term rentals. So we'd certainly appreciate your guidance. Like like I said, if anybody's missing from that list, let's wait to talk about that until we get to next steps. Okay. Let's go back to the other slide. Sure. sure. Um, and uh, is there a, I guess, a messaging plan um, within your scope of work also? I understand that we'll be looking to develop code here, but how that is communicated to, uh, to the public and our visitors. Um, and I can appreciate there being um, I guess a landing page on our website, but uh, this will require, um, you know, a learning curve to a degree. Is, is that part of your mission here also? You mean, uh, Mr. Brown, in the nature of what we showed you with Kiowa and city of Charleston, that sort of thing? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. Let's just say that we decide that we mm -hmm. want to change the code or develop a code, I'm sorry. Um, you know, how does that, how does that get out to the world besides the website? Um, our, our scope does not include that at this point. It really just includes the development of the code. Okay. All right. Would appreciate that maybe being a recommendation at the end of the day also. Um, okay. and, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, in some cases it's, uh, it's just simply assigning the code to zoning districts, and then uh, in others, it's uh, you know potentially maybe an overlay. Um, I just offer up that Hilton Head is very unique <laughs> when it comes to our zoning districts, and also very unique in the fact that um, mm -hmm. before there were really zoning districts on Hilton Head, there were the planned unit developments. Okay, so that that piece of history I think needs to be studied along the way. Um, as you as you press forward. Uh, so the, to your questions here, um, you know, what impacts need to be mitigated for quality of life? Um, you've heard from from my colleagues thus far of some of the uh, the immediate uh, disruption, so to speak, when it comes to short term uh, rentals. Um, I'm going to try to expand a little bit here uh, because of the uh, the conversion rate. Um, so many uh, units are being converted to short-term rental. The, the, real, uh, the real struggle and uh, fear on, on our quality of life here is the fact that we are continuously losing more housing that could be there for workers to folks that are visiting, okay? Uh, just which just puts an extreme amount of pressure on the the workforce and those that are trying to operate uh, service and hospitality businesses. Um, so you know I, I think that's that's important here as we, as we move forward. Uh, you know what comments do you hear most about short term rentals? Um, again, um, you kind of never know where you you're going until you really understand where you came from. Uh, you know, we, we embarked upon a uh, land management ordinance rewrite uh, back during the recession, okay? Um, things were, were, were very tight here, um, very fearful that uh, development or redevelopment was not going to, to happen here on Hilton Head, uh, other areas 
in the region, um, in the state, and along the coastline. Um, we're making moves, and you know we we were very aggressive in rewriting our land management ordinance so that we could allow development. Okay, so um, a lot of the things that we hear most currently now is a, a byproduct of that. Uh, buildings are too high, um, too many bedrooms, not enough parking. Um, but again, that was a very deliberate action to uh, produce more development and, and redevelopment. Uh, so I think that, you know, putting the horse back in the barn, so to speak, may be difficult, um, but, you know, us understanding um, you know, what it has caused along the way is definitely uh, what we probably hear the most of. Uh, the question of should there be more or fewer, um, that one's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, and we got to be very, very careful as to how we answer that. I'll just, uh, I'll just go back again that, you know, there needs to be balance, of course, particularly since Hilton Head is so close to build out. Um, and this is not, not in your realm by any means, we've got our own project going on with affordable housing, but the, the question to me becomes, um, whatever the number of units that is left to be built out of Hilton Head, what percentage of that should be uh, short-term rentals? What percentage of that should be uh, affordable housing? And what percentage of that should just be market rate housing for, for, uh, for residents? So uh, that's a very difficult question to, to answer. Um, and I think as we go through our district master planning efforts, that will probably be more uh, more knowledgeable to to answer that question. Um, as far as the demand is concerned, absolutely, um, we are once again named the number one destination in the continental U.S. So why would you not want to? set up shop and rent short term here on Hilton Head, okay? Um, you know, that has a lot to do with our, our marketing, okay? Um, if, if we were uh, just as good at being a, a place that folks would want to move and live and work, um, you know, maybe the demand goes down slightly. Um, so I'm not sure that you fix all of that with code. Um, that, that is part of our, our marketing plan and our marketing mission. And again, that's why I asked the question earlier as far as the problem statement is concerned, because um, I don't want your scope to be so limited as to we're trying to code our way out of a problem here that maybe uh, needs a little bit more attention. And uh, the last one, uh, you know, what's a, what's a durable... Uh, program look like on Hilton Head Island. Um, this is not my business. So I don't know if I could answer that question. I think that's why we hired you guys. Um, but, you know, I think it, if I could take a stab at it at all, um, I'll just go back to, it will give us the opportunity to accomplish the goal of having some balance here when it comes to the type of um, experience that one would have on Hilton Head. And that's for those that visit and for those that live here. And going back to, you know, quality of life has so many aspects to it, um, but we are at a tipping point now where our quality of life and the quality of those, uh, those that are visiting experience is, uh, is being threatened um, because uh, we have been focused too much on quantity and not as much focused on quality. Uh, so whatever program comes out of this, I think uh, a, a, a major focus on quality um, overall on Hilton Head is, is probably the best, best action. Uh, so th those are my attempts to answer these questions, um, but would gravely ask that uh, this this deck be shared with us so we can study it a little bit more and think a little bit more about what's in front of us. Those are my comments, Thanks. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alex. Um, as always, very good comments from the three of you. Uh, let me add mine. Um, Tyson and Kelly, uh, 
I want to thank you for putting together uh, a compendium of, of our challenges and what other uh, places have responded to those challenges, how the other places have responded to those challenges. Uh, it gives me a sense of confidence that maybe we can bring our situation into balance. Uh, and you mentioned balance and, and Alex mentioned balance. And I really think that that has to be our um, objective, our purpose. Uh, I have a question um, just for my own information. We all have anecdotal evidence. Uh, our guts tell you things are happening. Uh, we react to complaints and so on. Have, have there been any sort of statistical, re has any statistical research been done to quantify impacts either on values, on affordable housing, um, anything beyond our sense of what's going on in our gut? There have been uh, scattered academic um, journals on this. I was on a panel in the mid aughts, I guess, with an economist who is evaluate, trying to evaluate the impact on property values. Um, what I think we can do, though, Mr. Ames, is look look into the data and see what we can find and make some recommendations to you if you want to do any of that kind of research for Hilton Heads, Hilton Heads well, specifically. Yeah. You, you mentioned academic. Yeah, it, I'd be interested in reading any, any studies that you might dig up uh, regarding quality of life, uh, impacts on people, uh, anything that is beyond what our guts are telling us, our, our intuitions are, are telling us. And, and that goes to what Alex uh, asked, and that is a problem statement. Um, I think that's that's important for us as a community to have so that all all residents and owners understand how we perceive the issues and and I I perceive the issues uh, in this way uh, the impacts are economic um, our real estate values are changing dramatically, and not only because of the COVID consequences and the general national marketplace, but as people realize that their income by renting short term can support mar larger mortgages, they are willing to pay higher and higher real estate values. And that connects to what Alex has also mentioned, and that is a dramatically uh, um, decline in our affordable housing. Uh, there are examples on Hilton Head where uh, workforce housing that has been there for decades is now transitioning into um, uh, short-term rentals. The impact on neighborhoods has also been mentioned um, and, and the impact on quality of life, the perception of Hilton Head uh, so that I think there's an issue there uh, that ought to be in the uh, uh, problem statement. Uh, absentee ownership. This came out uh, loudly and clearly uh, during our uh, COVID discussions early on. Uh, we have owners of property on Hilton Head who rarely come to Hilton Head, don't understand Hilton Head, have little connection to Hilton Head, their interest in Hilton Head is only in the income that their short-term rental can provide. Uh, I think that is counterproductive for the brand of Hilton Head and for the reception that uh, potential renters or renters receive on the island. Uh, that suggests to me that this owner-occupied issue is of some importance to us. Um, you mentioned um, also home sharing and digital platforms. I feel in a sense, uh, municipalities have lost control and I don't know how to bring that back into control given those situations and you may have some insights there. 
uh, rate, on, rate of transition, uh, we have seen this uh, steep incline of, of these uh, tr um, permanent or uh, short, long-term rentals going to short-term rentals. And that gives us as a community, as a town council, uh, a loss of predictability or um, uh, understanding future impacts. So I think there's uh, tr the rate of transition is an impact that we need to think about. Um, also, there's an ex there are extremes of quality regarding rental accommodations. Uh, and that has impacts on our brand. And so um, the workforce housing units that have transitioned into short-term rentals are oftentimes in complexes that uh, are very, very different than a resort vacation uh, uh, environment. And so I think there's incompatibility there that we need to deal with. Those are some of the impacts that I see are negative um, and of consequence. Um, so that, that answers what impacts need to be mitigated for the quality of life, I think, in large measure. Uh, what comments do you hear most about uh, STRs? Um, it is the incompatibility issue, um, the, the, the noise, uh, the parking of cars, um, the loss of uh, workforce housing, and so on. So I, I, I think we're all pretty much on board with what we hear. Should there be more, fewer, or current number of STRs? I will say that if we could rebalance where we are uh, with short-term rentals, and I'm not positive how uh, uh, effective we can be, but obviously we are going in the wrong direction with workforce housing, with neighborhood integrity, um, with uh, impacts. Uh, the, Alex mentioned marketing. Uh, unless we can uh, get under control the number of tourists on the island. And if the objective is only to uh, increase that number, then uh, the short-term rental market is going to be a hot, lead, uh, hot demand or hot be in demand. So I, I think that there is a marketing issue here as well. Um, so my, my uh, hope would be that there would be fewer that we could um, reestablish a stronger permanent residential neighborhood um, where they used to exist. And I'm thinking about areas that uh, are near the beach, but not on the beach. Um, is demand for STs likely to remain high for Hilton Head? Yeah, as long as we increase the number of tourists coming to the island, there is going to be a growing demand uh, for short-term rentals. Uh, the, uh, there's, there is more money to be made renting short-term than long-term. And, and that has consequences across the board. And what does a durable functioning STR program look like on Hilton Head? Well, I, th I think that the word balance is what needs to be established, but understanding and having a political um, consensus on what that balance looks like will be our challenge. So I, I, I tremendously appreciate uh, giving us the opportunity, the four of us, to speak to these issues. What are your recommendations for next steps? David, before you go there, can I just emphasize a couple of things that came up? Um, yes that I think that um, all of y'all um, all made really good points. And I hope I don't step on anyone's toes, but to me, as I was listening to you, things that I wanna make sure emphasize is, is something that you said, I'll, I'll start there, um, that it's the commitment to the island, both by the absentee 
owners, as well as the um, visitors who take advantage of renting beautiful um, homes um, that we have here in Hilton Head and pa are packed with such a high level of occupancy that it makes the rate less than a, and with no, dis a, a, a roadside motel. Um, and, and so it's the amount of commitment to protecting the value and the special uniqueness of our island here in Hilton Head um, that is lacking um, both from those absentee owners and those who may not necessarily um, see, see the connection when they are um, crammed into a unit. It takes the place of the parking issue. It creates the safety issues, which all creates the, the point that I think all of us have made that the neighborhood integrity, um, which was a great way of uh, stating it, the neighborhood integrity, our residents who are here, whether they're full-time or part-time, quite frankly, but certainly our full-time residents, that their lack of um, ability to maintain their quality of life and peace um, and their commitment to protecting our island, I think are very important um, factors in all of this. And I think that's across the island. You mentioned that they're anecdotal. I have a meeting this afternoon with a PUD who has a focus group of their own. The PUDs, those behind the gate, are actually looking to us to help develop something that will support what they can do. Um, and so we are the first or maybe the second tier of um, being able to really take control and manage this. So um, it's, it's anecdotal, but it's developing and percolating all throughout the island in their own little groups that's, um, that are now being formed and coming forth asking for help. So that's, I just wanted to jump in with that. Um, I told you I would probably have something more to say as usual. Thank you for the time. As always, uh, Glenn or Alex, before we go on to next steps. Uh, I'm ready for next steps. Okay, Alex, you good? I'm good also. Okay, let's go to next steps. Sure. Okay, well, we've, we've talked a little bit about the focus group sessions, which will be um, our, our next, next steps. Um, we are meeting with a few representatives from PUDs um, Friday morning, and we're in the process of trying to schedule with some of these other groups, single family neighborhood residents, public service districts, rental management companies, realtors, um, the chamber, and the um, Home Builders Association. So if there's anyone else who comes to mind, you know, today or, or you know, a few days down the road, if something occurs to you, we're, we're happy to talk with anybody. Um, then we plan to reconvene with town staff to recommend the next steps. Um, we do anticipate holding two public open houses. Um, the first would be prior to preparing the draft ordinance, um, just you know, to, to go through some of the questions that, that we've talked about here today and, and get an understanding of um, you know, the, the concerns and um, where the public's coming from. And then we'd um, anticipate having another public open house following the preparation of a draft ordinance so that the, the community has something to respond to. Um, and then after that, we'll move on to um, the proposed, uh, an outline of the proposed approach, which we'll bring to you all for feedback um, and then uh, move into drafting the, the actual ordinance. All right. Um, questions about next steps, Alex? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I guess I can handle the, uh, the path forward here. As far as the focus uh, group sessions, um, this is probably a, 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 a odd category, but um, you know, as we went through our uh, our visioning process and the rewriting of our conference and plan. Um, I, I, I sat on the steering committee there and I'd always say, don't forget about the old average Joe, okay? Um, and I'm sure you may run into some of those average Joes as we uh, visit the neighborhoods, but um, you know, this, again, this topic, 
does not just affect those that are renting short-term units, okay? It has an effect over our whole island. Um, so I think the, uh, the business community um, to a degree needs to be approached, not just through the Chamber of Commerce, okay? Um, and not just those that are, are renting um, or, or managing the short-term units, okay? Um, you know, owners of, of, of restaurants um, and various businesses, I think, need to be a part of this discussion, all right? And um, of course, they're, they're employees. And if you're going to be visiting Hilton Head to, to, to go through these sessions, um, just show up at a, at a local bar and just ask the question, <laughs> what do you feel about it? Okay, I think because th those, those comments and that input, again, um, it all boils down to this, this, uh, this soup that we're trying to make. So I think it's important that we don't leave those individuals out. Um, those are my only comments on the next steps here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Glenn? Yes, thank you. I would like to challenge our staff uh, to review our plan, which for our consultants information is what we call our plan for the future here. Uh, and I would like for the staff to review our plan to identify which aspects of the plan are impacted by short-term rentals and make that information known and available uh, to these experts that we have helping us. Um, I can't think of other groups um, that might be included in focus group sessions. I, I think you've probably hit most of it there. Um, and um, I just look forward to moving forward with this and hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Tammy? Thank you. Um, a couple of questions uh, in terms of focus groups. Single family neighborhoods, how is that arranged? Do you mean which, which neighborhoods? Well, well, that's a good guess, as well as um, the, a contact point, a gathering, a gathering of um, interested people who would like to share in participating in these group in a group. Sure. Um, well, we uh, staff put together some contact information for different neighborhoods, and I'm if. I'm happy to pull that up unless Terry remembers them off the top of her head. But they, um, you know, we had, sure, I, I guess they, they may be HOA presidents or, or HOA representatives. Is that right, Terry? Right, so we looked at, we looked at kind of the, the main neighborhoods that uh, where we see a lot of short-term rentals occurring, where we could find a, um, you know, a POA representative. We started with them. I also looked back at, um, comments that we had received from people over the past few months with concerns um, related to short-term rentals and uh, pass that information on to Kelly as well to reach out to. And then I know with at least one of those um, where we were having a little bit of trouble getting some more interest, um, one of those um, people that we had reached out to said that they had additional people that would be happy to participate in it as well. So we definitely want to be inclusive or yeah, and we want to, as many people that want to participate and get and share that information. Right. I would be um, interested in seeing that group of, um, that you're assembling. There are communities, neighborhoods like mine, that um, we have no POA or so we have no direct contact. But as everyone who knows, um, we are overrun um, with issues and problems related to short-term rentals. And so um, we definitely need to be involved. Um, obviously I'm involved, but I'd like to have others from my neighborhood um, involved and I'm not sure how, um, but so I'll, I, I will get in touch with you, Terry, or you get in touch with me and we'll figure that one out. Um, in terms of the other, making sure that it's specifically because I have a specific request and they are my, uh, in my ward, um, making sure that when it comes to single family neighborhoods, whether it's grouped into that one or whether it's under a PUD, I'm not sure, um, but we wanna make sure that the Forest Beach group neighborhood is included 
in all discussions because as we know, they are on that list of um, neighborhoods having significant problems. I just find the rest of these, um, and I hear the question with regard to establishing what is our problem as a starting point, and that's always a good idea. Um, and I hear that we're, you know, looking towards a variety of different influences, whether or not um, how this pertains to workforce housing, et cetera. Um, I, I see a connection there. I'm not, I, I'm always reluctant to say um, that any particular neighborhood, just because the residents and the owners there may work on the island, that we call them workforce housing units when that designation is really meaningless to that particular neighborhood and somewhat um, maybe derogatory. So um, being that, saying that and some of these, um, some of those certainly should be included because they have looked at the advantage of um, taking in, I, I love the comment, that, the uh, phrase that Kelly's been using, sharing economy something I haven't heard um, before, but perhaps in those instances, um, folks looking for a, um, um, an economic advantage in their life, a, a step forward within that sharing um, economy and how it impacts them as um, is important to consider as well. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that anyone else, this looks like a pretty comprehensive list. I'm not sure how, some of them are really impacted by our short-term rentals. Um, going back to that problem statement, I think we, we have all come to where we are today because we've heard enough across the island from people who are concerned about what's happening in their neighborhoods and how they can live their lives with the distraction and the um, destruction of their quality of life um, as residents of the community. So um, I don't wanna to get too far astray from solving what I think brought us to this point um, to begin with. And um, a, a further explanation maybe, or just a note as to how some of these um, focus groups um, really are impacted by what is it that we're trying to do. That's all, thanks. Thank you, Tammy. Mm -hmm. Uh, my thoughts. Um, I, I do think it's important to have a problem statement uh, that basically tells the public why we're even doing this. Whether or not that should be something that is written by Tyson and his firm or whether that's something Terry staff should be uh, writing. Uh, my instinct at this moment is telling me that, Terry, you should write it because we are the uh, agency that is requesting a solution. Um, and I would suggest that if you can do that in the next day or so, uh, to send it out to public planning committee so we just know what uh, might be presented to each one of these uh, constituent groups or focus groups. Uh, I'd also like to ask you, Terry, to send us <clears throat> that list of uh, neighborhoods um, that are not uh, specifically called out here. Now, I'd like to see that because there are some neighborhoods <clears throat> and uh, uh, properties within my ward, and I'd like to make sure they're included. Um, so. I mentioned at the outset, Tyson, would this be the presentation? Uh, having seen it, the presentation, I'm more inclined to just simply ask you, how are you going to go about presenting this to the different um, focus groups and how much time is going to be involved in that presentation? And then what are your expectations of length for the meeting? Each one has been <laughs> scheduled for an hour. Well, that's our anticipation, anticipated duration. We can always reconvene, particularly with Zoom. Now it's easy to do that, but we're looking at an hour. I would anticipate maybe 10 minutes of presentation. Um, the point of these is to get input from them. 
I think something like what we just presented to this group would be useful, but I would get a little less deep on some of the examples, mm -hmm. um, you know, and less formality in terms of introducing the firm and that kind of thing. We can kind of go around the room. And so I would say about 10 minutes of background. M most people we're meeting with, they're going to know the issues, or at least they have some sense of it. So just giving them some context and framework and then move into feedback. That makes sense. That's good. Okay. And I, I um, should note at this point, all of the, the sessions are anticipated to be virtual, which um, does give us some, some flexibility to accommodate different schedules. So that, that's what we've done so far is sent out um, sort of meeting polls to try and um, figure out when folks are available so that we can, we can get these on the calendar. And Kelly, how many people are you expecting to be in each session? Um, well, honestly, we haven't heard back from a whole lot of folks. Um, I think the most maybe in one session uh, was four in the, let's see, the, P, the PUDs. Um, actually, we heard back from six folks, two of the neighborhoods um, prohibit short-term rentals altogether, um, but we did have um, four folks respond to our meeting poll. And then um, as Terry mentioned, we had um, some HOA representatives from single family neighborhoods. We, we only got a couple of responses there. And Ms. Becker, one was from um, a gentleman representing Forest Beach. Um, but they, um, uh, one gentleman we did hear back from had indicated um, that he would uh, provide us some more contacts. So hopefully we'll have more than a couple of folks in that meeting. Um, and then we're working with the Realtors Association um, to, to get a group of realtors together. We've heard back from one um, public service district and then I think two of the rental management companies. Um, so cer certainly we'd like to have more participation than that, but so right now we've got anywhere from one to four folks per session. Let me ask the question of the PPC members. Uh, do we have a role to play in making sure these are well attended? Yes. Alex, Glenn? Yeah, so I, I'd, uh, I'd piggyback on what, uh, what Councilman Stanford said earlier. Um, you know, of course, I can appreciate that we have an issue before us that we need to solve. But until we are not just making it relative, but also establishing what we're trying to accomplish in the betterment of Hilton Head in a futuristic standpoint, and I'm going back to his comment about the the, the, the comprehensive plan. Um, I'm not sure that you are going to get people so excited about attending, okay? Um, so to answer your question directly, Ms. Thames, yes, I think we play a part in it, okay? Um, we have to be responsible for, um, for our residents, uh, our business owners, and also our visitors. And I've always... Uh, I've always said communication is the key. Um, it's not always as easy as an email out to a group expecting some response. Um, many of us are, are, are very, uh, very busy. Um, emails tend to, to get lost to a degree, um, particularly if you don't know what we're trying to accomplish, right? So some messaging along the way, um, I think is important. Um, if we're looking to get better participation. Okay. Um, I, I think it's important that we who are trying to get as much public input at the earliest stages of this have a role to play. Uh, I have three PUDs in my ward, uh, obviously a public service district I am friends and have associates in rental management companies. I know realtors. I think if Terry or Kelly, you sent us your list, we might be able to make a personal contact and request for participation that might 
uh, add to your numbers. Now, if there's some uh, a logistical issue there, let me know. But I'm suggesting that the four of us can play a role in helping you get attendance. David, I absolutely agree with that. Um, it is part of our responsibility here uh, to get the word out about this. And uh, each of us has various email lists and contact lists out there. And I, for one, am ready to spread the word uh, in the manner that I usually do. But I would like to have sent back to me who it is that interested parties should contact rather than contacting me back and then trying to be a filter. Let us have contact information, uh, email address, however you prefer for that to be done so that we can spread the word in, in that fashion. Um, and while two of the communities in, in my ward already prohibit short-term rentals, um, I have other areas uh, that where that doesn't apply. And I wanna make sure they get the word about this from the beginning. So yes, it is our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Kelly, having heard, um, how can we be helpful and not counterproductive? Well, um, that it, we would definitely appreciate um, your assistance in, in getting the word out. Um, we can uh, put our heads together with Terry and kind of figure out the best way to do that. Um, what we had previously done was send out um, email with a little bit of background and a link to um, you know, fill in their meeting availability, which <clears throat> I think inclu included last week. So it might be good perhaps for us to put together new meeting polls that um, you know, in include additional dates just to give folks some, some flexibility. Um, but again, let, uh, let's, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I, would, I, I think our role would be to simply encourage people when they receive um, a, a request for participation that they participate. I don't think okay. we need to get involved in dates and so on and so forth. We are simply, sure enthusiastically encouraging people to participate. I will Terry. definitely be in, in touch with people um, that I will reach out to um, who, has, who have reached out to me, who has made this a priority for themselves. I, I have a question in terms of it, in terms of the length of time um, all of this takes um, to get us to where um, it is that we're hoping to be to give some relief to the people who are having the most difficulties with this. Um, I know that organizing takes some time and persistence. Um, is it better to poll people in terms of when they're available and give them or just give them a couple of options? And so that you've already slotted that in um, so that things move a little bit um, I guess more quickly, lack of a better way of saying it. I'm just wondering what the overall time frame um, in terms of start to finish for something like this might be. Kelly, can I jump in here? Absolutely. I had a, I've had a couple of thoughts here on this. Um, our initial time frame, um, Ms. Becker, has been around next June to be done having an ordinance acted on by full council. Um, the idea of the open houses came up in a later discussion with staff. Based on what I've heard today, um, I am thinking about the, the idea of the problem statement, and it sounds very important to this committee that that be correct and that y'all all have consensus on it. Um, I think in terms of the focus groups, to keep it moving, we maybe, as Kelly said, give them, and this is us, not y'all, we give them another week or two and then we set the meetings for when we have some response from somebody. The thing I thought I would get some feedback on is when we, I've heard that, I've heard about, you know, we need to make sure we include the average Joe, the average business owner, the person who may not be heard via a neighborhood group or PUD. That is what we want to capture in some way and would capture through the open house. So some of that is messaging and outreach. So we make sure that people who 
don't get invited to a focus group meeting, either we create a focus group meeting or they know they can come to the open house. Um, so my question specifically is, particularly in Mr. Brown's point, are, are there other groups that we need to create focus groups from or will the people you're thinking about come to an open house if they're aware of it, it's the right time of day, et cetera? Yeah, I think the open house is, is appropriate. Um, the key to all of this, of course, is, is the messaging. Um, yeah. Even with the commitment from the four of us to help with uh, better attendance, unless we have a strong message to put in front of folks, the interest may still not be there. So I think that's, that's the key. Okay, the other thing I have in terms of time frame is if we have an open house, I'm gonna guess it's 30 to 45 days out. Y'all meet again in about a month as a committee. Um, we're gonna put pen to paper at some point. And the question is, will we, we do need to hit a point, I think we've said we're taking input and we need to start writing now or we could spend six months just getting input. What we unfortunately find in most situations is that people don't get real focused and attentive and vocal until we get close to the second reading. <laughs> so we don't wanna wait that long, of course, but what we hope we can, what people might respond better to is a draft. So by the end of the year, I'd like to have a draft out there that has the committee support that people can start reacting to. We can always amend it, but I'm afraid if it stays too vague for too long, that might be, to Ms. Becker's point where we start dragging out needlessly. Tyson, I, I agree with your sentiments. Uh, my reaction is that we should be contracting this input schedule as much as we can. And okay. when you said 30 to 45 days out, I that triggered in my mind that uh, one, we've got to get our message right, and then we have to send out some dates um, uh, uh, specific dates um, come or not don't participate. In, in other words, this this uh, uh, flexibility of schedules, I think, is is working against us. So, Kelly, my reaction is that we are uh, we identify the people we want to come. We participate in encouraging the, them to come, and we get the input, uh, and we move forward. Glenn. Thank you. Uh, Tyson, I think you're thinking about getting a draft in place sooner rather than later is right on the mark because it makes sense to me that when we're talking about vague concepts, that's one thing, but when we're talking about more specific rules, prohibitions and so forth, we're talking about something entirely different. And so the sooner we can get to that, the better but I agree that what we have said today about picking up on what Alex said, working on a problem statement, that, that's, a, that's very well said and well needed here so that we understand what problem we're working on. Um, and then I agree that we need to have the public input, but that we shouldn't be dragging it out longer because we've got a problem that is, in some areas, a crisis. And so we have to deal with it, we have to react to it. So we'll look forward to that input. Thank you, David. Let, 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 me, let me give you my opinion. Um, uh, I agree that we need the draft as soon as possible in order to have people focus, that makes sense. I think as a public body, we need to make sure the public is invited to uh, understand what the issue is, i.e. the problem statement. Uh, and, and Kelly, perhaps the way of achieving the concept of balance in that focus group is to have polarities. In other words, give people choices this way or that way. And, and I think that's all we're really trying to achieve in that public input is sentiment of that, that varia variability from one extreme to the other then you, you have achieved the public input. You've, you've gotten the opportunity from us to hear our opinions, and I think you can start drafting. So I'm very much on board. We ought to be expediting the draft. 
and and I don't know if two weeks, three weeks, four weeks is our threshold for focus and public input. I don't know. I think that's something we need feedback from you, but I would constrain that to the degree that we can. It, it, and if I can just pack up, because I think Glenn correctly stated something and, and, and it's a concern. Um, that, then in many cases, um, situations around the town that I, people that I hear from regularly and participate with um, in discussions, um, this is something of a crisis for them. And um, when I hear June, I hear this might not be in effect to help people in our next season. And, and granted, don't want that to sound like I want to go so fast that we get it wrong. In fact, having um, seen how that LMO rewrite went a number of years ago that had so many failings in it um, and that the public was not involved um, in a meaningful way, I don't want that to happen in, in this situation. So I'm very sensitive to making sure that we hear from all of the stakeholders that need to be heard from and that everyone's voices are um, clear to us. But having said that, there are those communities which really do feel as though this is a crisis for them. And so just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Terry, have you had a conversation with the town manager of staff's expectations on timing? We have, we probably need to have um, a little bit more thorough one, but we have talked about it. I think we want to, um, we don't want to drag it out, but we also want it to be a good solid ordinance. We don't want something where it's, um, you know, we, we rush too fast and, you know, there's some things missing in it. So we do want to make sure that it's comprehensive and um, well done, but we also, you know, are not interested in dragging this out. We do recognize that this is a you know, a really serious issue for the community. Okay, so um, we'll understand more about that, but in my conversations with the town manager, there was, if I interpreted it correctly, um, an expectation of uh, getting an ordinance long before June, but uh, that may have been a misinterpretation on my part. Um, so- And not a uh, draft, yeah. Draft much sooner. That was like yeah. actual second reading has been completed, et cetera. Okay. Um, Kelly, having heard everything that's been uh, stated regarding next steps, um, why don't you try to summarize where you think we're headed? Sure. Um, well, the next step will be to um, reach out again to potential focus group participants and um, like you all mentioned, it might be good to go ahead and set up some dates based on the responses we've received so far and, you know, email the rest of the folks and say, hey, this, you know, if you if you can participate at this time, we'd love to have you. Otherwise, you know, make them aware of the um, open house that we'll eventually do that will be, you know, open to, to the public. Um, yeah, I think that'll that'll be our our. Our next steps and um, getting that public workshop, given that some thought as to how um, how we want to structure that, how we want to, um, I assume at this point it would be virtual, um, which we have seen um, can, can certainly help increase participation. Um, so I think we'll need to figure out the best way to, um, to host that and to get the word out about it. Um, and to, to get a constructive dialogue going at, at that particular meeting. Um, you didn't mention our participation. Is that an indication that you think that maybe that complicates the process too much uh, or not? Not at all. Your participation uh, in, in what respect? Um, well, there's a log logistical issue here. I don't know who you have contacted. So mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to help, I need to know who you've contacted. That puts Certainly. a burden on you to tell us. And I just, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but I do believe that there are some people who I feel 
ought to be involved at this earliest, earliest stage. So I, I need to have more information, but I don't want to burden you uh, uh, ineffectively, so. No, no, certainly. We, we um, are, can certainly email you the list of folks we've contacted and indicate who we've heard back from, um, you know, so okay, that you can help us spread the word to some other folks. And why don't you do that? And Terry, why don't you provide us? Um, well, actually, if Kelly's going to send us the, us the comprehensive list, then we'll know what neighborhoods have been included. Non-PUD neighborhoods have been included. Okay. And Terry, if you can get us a draft of a um, problem statement uh, for our review. And again, I'm not trying to wordsmith this. I just want to understand what we are saying to the public yeah. in, your, in, your, in your introduction. Okay. Why are, we, why are we doing this? Yeah, and, and to go back to Kelly's slide earlier, we're, our next step for us literally is going to be getting back with Terry and Chris and Mark on the phone today or tomorrow to um, debrief from this meeting. And then we are aware that you meet okay. again at the end of October and we plan to be before you to continue the discussion in October. The nature of that discussion, I think, is TBD based on what we've heard today in our meeting tomorrow with them. Let me but is it your expectation? Go ahead, Glenn. I was gonna say, our next scheduled meeting is the end of October. We all recognize the importance of this. If we get to a point where you need our input, let us know and we can schedule a special meeting. Sure. Especially sure. since we're doing right. it virtually, it's not that difficult. Thank right. you. And also I'm suggesting that maybe within this month, you're putting schedules together that will give us input so that at, when we meet in October, we can say we're ready to move forward. Is Correct. That, okay, okay, good. That is the uh, idea. The, the only thing that I could see taking longer than four weeks is gonna be the open house just because we haven't scheduled it yet, but we'll see. I would hope it'd be very close. So you're, we can summarize for you what we've heard largely. Okay, I'm, I'm comfortable. Everybody else comfortable where we are at this time? Okay, let's see. Do we have any other business? No other business before us? Oh, well, yes, we do have the new business of a consideration of the proposed calendar for year 2022. Um, any comments from the committee? Is there a motion to accept the uh, proposed schedule? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, Teresa, would you call the roll, please? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Becker? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Stanford? Yes. Mr. Ames? Yes. Appreciate Motion that. carries 4-0. Um, with no other business, we can adjourn. But before we do, I want to, again, reiterate what I said uh, to um, Tyson and Kelly before. Uh, I really have a sense of progress today and something that gives me uh, confidence that we can articulate uh, a balance. And if we can do that, then you can draft an ordinance that might get us to there. And I appreciate that um, capability and uh, your interest and patience with us moving forward. Thank you. And with that, we'll adjourn. Have a good Thank day. Thank you. Y'all too.